Hi, welcome to Ethereal Mechanics video number eight. Uh, in this video we're going to demystify science and improve it. Okay, if you don't know, my name is Robert Justinti. If you don't know what Ethereum Mechanics is, uh, video number one, that's EMV001, is the introductory video that explains everything. This is a, uh, a video for general audiences. We're going to discuss science in general at a very low level. Uh, basically, science has been with us for a long, long, long time. Science is not a new invention. Eventually, uh, 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 in the beginning of man, monkey would see, the man would see the fire, and he'd, that would be an observation. And then he would come up with a great idea. Gee, I hope I can heat my home with this. So he puts it on his, uh, he figures out, that since wood burns and his club is made of wood, that he can transfer the fire to his club. Then he goes and he tries to heat his home with it, and obviously, you know, through scientific uh, invention, things are not always, always come out perfect, but because man keeps on trying, he eventually gets it right. Uh, so science has been with us since the beginning. The mere fact that science is nothing more than monkey see, monkey do. Um, the early man was able to see that a particular berry could be eaten by a deer, so he theorized that he could eat that berry too, and it wasn't poisonous. Science has been around with us since the beginning. Unfortunately, we haven't evolved much from monkey see, monkey do. And um, like for example, we fall, still falsely believe that a positive outcome of experiment confirms a theory which I'm going to show you is completely wrong. And we're still deriving theories from observations which is completely backwards. And uh, we always stop at the first theory that fits the observation and then dig in and we hold on to accepted theories with ludicrous tenacity. Um, it seems that scientists would prefer to sacrifice virgins to the theories of Einstein and Maxwell rather than dare question them. So we have to radically change our scientific method. We can no, no longer rely on Stone Age methods that are inefficient and more conducive to religion than as a method to find the truth. Uh, and by the way, this is a long video, so I'm going to go really, really, really fast. Okay, we have to begin by studying and improving the basic components of science. We have observations, theories, models, and laws. Um, and then after we get through these, we're going to introduce a newer scientific method. So what is observations? Observations are monkey see. We observe nature. Uh, in experiments now, there's no longer monkey do. Experiments are a part of observing nature. We make experiments to observe nature. But we have to be careful how to interpret our observation. For example, if a ship passes in the night, which is moving, or are both moving. Let me show you an example. If, the hum if humans observe that the sun moves through the sky, they conclude that the sun moves around the earth. This is a theory that was derived directly from observation. Observation became the theory and it was wrong. Uh, when, we, when we looked at things reciprocally, we realized that, hey gee, maybe we're moving and the stars are stationary and then we are more closer to the truth. Okay, here's another falsity that we derive directly from observation. If I take this little magnet Okay, and I put the little magnet underneath the paper, and I grab some of these here iron filings. Okay, we're going to see a magnetic field form. And that actually came out better than I'd hoped. Okay, and so what happened was, is mankind saw this, and they made this their theory for the magnetic field. Again, another theory derived from observation. And I'm going to show you in later videos that the magnetic field model is incorrect. You cannot derive the field from the observation. Because if you did that, then you'd have to say that wind is composed of ripple dunes because of its effect on beach sand. You can't do that. Okay, and let me give you another demonstration. Let's say this bucket of water here. This water represents some kind of field we want to explore. So, well, okay, let's throw some stuff on this too. Let's throw some iron filings on it. Well, that didn't help us understand the field. Okay, let's throw some hex nuts. Gee, that didn't help us explore the field. All right, so let's try something else. How about, uh, where did it go? Oh, well, it's gone, but my next choice here is throw some paper confetti. Well, that seemed to work better. Okay, but what if I put 25 pounds of paper confetti on here? That would just completely displace the water. All right, so we can't trust the things we use to measure whatever fields we're trying to measure because they're going to interfere with the field. So ultimately what we cannot 
base our observation, our theory, whatever theory we come up with, has to explain all the things we dumped in the water, the iron filings, the hex nuts, and the paper. We cannot just base our model on one set of data uh, inter interaction with the field. Let me put that off to the side before I make a mess. All right, so what do we learn? We have to flip science on its head. Theories and models must not be derived from observations. Okay? Theories must agree with what we observe. Okay? And we may have to be prepared to accept that theories may, we're looking at it may be an optical illusion. Example is Galileo. Also, we have to remember is that our tools may interfere with what we're measuring. In electrical engineering, we call that meter loading. In quantum mechanics, they call that the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. If you measure it, you change it. Okay, so we, have to, we can't interpret what we see, but our models must predict what we see, so it's not as much simple as monkey see anymore. And then we have the rule of acquisition number 10, which I had meant to paste in there, but I forgot, which is now, do not derive theory from observations. Theories must match what we observe, not be derived from what we observe. And I got some examples here. You can pause and read that because we got a lot to cover. Okay. All right. Now, theories are monkey guess. Okay, and a theory is nothing more than a guess of what is causing something to happen. Like a monkey could say, or a caveman could say, fire grows, therefore it must be a living thing. Because only living things back when we were uh, new to nature, only living things actually moved. So we had to assume since fire moves, it must be alive. Um, and then we can bring in the recap of uh, these rules of acquisition here, but we're going to recap those in a later video. Uh, you can, um, well... Rule of acquisition number one, correct answers prove nothing because wrong theories can give correct answers. Number two, it only takes one wrong answer to prove a theory wrong. Rule of acquisition number three we covered a second ago, which is bad theories are like the wrong path in a maze. The sooner they are abandoned, the quicker the maze can be solved. And then we have a new one, which is rule of acquisition number 11, that theories are infinite. There may be infinite number of theories that can rationally explain a given set of observations, like a conspiracy theory. You ever see the shows where they cover all the different ways a, a theory could fit the, the, the observations? The probability that we have a correct theory is essentially zero. So we have to say that a given theory... To, so for anyone to say that a given theory is irrefutable is to dismiss infinite possibilities. This constitutes an act of infinite stupidity, and humans are better at stupidity than at science. Okay, and lastly, number 12, there are only two types of theories. Wrong theories and theories that have yet to be proven wrong. So that's uh, what we're covering with theories now. So let's get these out of the way. Okay, that's theory. So we covered observations, now we covered theories. Let's cover models. Models are monkey do. Models are just a means to mimic natural phenomena. Nothing more, nothing less. Just a means to mimic. Okay. There are many types of models. See the next page. For example, you have 3D models. Okay, a maker's dress form is a way that a dressmaker could, without having to pay someone to stand there, can have a dimension that fits the most average of the person they're trying to fit in the particular market they're trying to go after, and they can make one dress that could fit the, the, the average person so they could sell the most dresses. Then you have globes, another form of 3D models. 2D models is a map. But one of the things we have to understand, oh, and uh, why are they incomplete? Well, if you're designing a dress for an Angelina Jolie action sequence, this model is not going to tell you if that dress is going to hold up under the rigors of that action sequence. Models are notoriously incomplete. Uh, this one is a map. If you, this rest stop that's over here is not going to tell you if there's cherry coke in the vending machine. This map is not complete enough to tell you that. It doesn't tell you, you know, how high the elevations are. This is a simple road atlas. There's graphic models. Artillerymen, they use a graphic firing table where they dial in the range to target and it tells them how high to set the howitzer and it tells them how much spin is going to cause the drift of the artillery around to go off so they can correct for that. And before the day of Pythagorean theorem, um, if you wanted to calculate how much material you need for a roof, people would actually draw, you know, if that's three feet by eight feet, they would draw three inches by eight inches and measure how many inches is the hypotenuse and that would tell them how many feet. Okay, so graphic models are still being used today. Then we have mathematical models. Mathematical models are the most powerful. They have a lot of predictive capability. They can be heavily advanced by computers. Okay, now one thing we have to be careful about is that nature should be fully described by mathematics. Okay, so there should be a theory or model of everything. But we've got to remember that 
Um, mathematics is only a human tool. It has not been handed to us by God in stone tablets, and there's a lot of imperfections in, in modern mathematics. Okay, and now there's a drawback to mathematics. Okay, mathematics is a superset of nature. I'm going to show you that in the next video in more, more clear detail. So therefore, um, not every so because even though nature can be fully described by mathematics, not everything you can derive mathematically actually it can exist in nature. Okay. Okay, uh, equation is just an ink smudges on a piece of paper. It's only a means to mimic natural phenomena, nothing more. Okay, then we have abstract models. An abstract model or an abstraction to a model is, is an intentional falsification to make it easier for our monkey brains to use them. For example, the B-field model classical theory uh, is just an abstraction. The contour lines on a topographical map, that's just an abstraction. You can't go out in your backyard and dig up the 200 contour line at 200 meet, meet, feet above sea level. Uh, this came from compassdude.com. A mass transit system is another form of abstract model because the distances are not to scale, but it gives you the general uh, relationship between all the stops on the, on the transit. Okay, and then you have empirical models. Okay, an empirical model is a model taken from measurements. It not, it's without a theory. It's without a theory. Like, for example, Stonehenge. They basically saw where the sun set on the horizon and put a stone there. And after a while, they were able to get a complete model of where the sunset would be and they would be able to plant. This is not come from space aliens, my friends. This is survival because up in the north where this was created, if you made a mistake and you planted too soon and your crops got killed by a late frost, you were going to starve. If you planted too late and your crops matured in the middle of the fall where they were killed by an early frost, you were going to die. And so getting the perfect time to plant is a survival thing. Our survival depended on having a good, accurate, and reliable way of knowing when to plant the crops. And because of that, we could probably plant two sets of crops in the season and increase our survivability. Okay, the same thing with the dressmakers farm. They took a whole bunch of ladies that were of the size they wanted to market a dress to and they took the average of all their dimensions and you know so these are empirical models models taken from measurements not from theory and then you have theoretical models it's a model developed from a theory that has not yet been observed like you know parallel universes dark matter wormholes etc so you can have and this is one of the problems i described earlier these are models that are derived mathematically from other models just because you can derive something mathematically from other models doesn't mean it exists. It might be, I mean, it might be there, but you, you, until you actually see it, you can't say it's true yet. Okay, so let's reca recap the properties of models. Models are only mimics. They're not subject to right or wrong. Models are either useful or useless. Okay, when I say the term wrong model in, in my later videos, that means a model based on a wrong theory. But the model still may be useless. Okay, there are also infinite ways to model any given set of observations. So there should be infinite mathematical models that could fit any number of, and we could saw that in the previous video when we discussed the cycles of science. Okay, now models are going to be typically incomplete. Models can still give correct answers even if the theory is wrong. And models most typically have limitations where they're useful. Like for example, even though flat earth is a wrong model, Architects still use the flat earth model today when designing small structures because it is not in any way valuable to, to c compute the curvature of the earth for something as small as a house or a phone booth. Okay, so let's recap rules of acquisition. We have new acquisition here for the, the things we just talked about. Rules of acquisition number 14 models are just a means to mimic. You can pause and read that. Uh, number 15, rule, models have limitations, and there's usually two reasons, because either they're incomplete or they're based on a wrong theory. And number 16, mathematics is a superset of nature, and we're going to show what this diagram means in the next video. Thus, it's possible to mathematically derive effects or, and outcomes that do not exist in nature. And any, but However, anything in the universe should be math, mathematically mimical, mimicked by mathematics. Okay, so let's go on. Let's talk about laws. Science has these things they call laws, and it's very disingenuous because it gives young physicists the idea that we really actually know what we're doing. Like we have Gauss's law, and Coulomb's law, and everything we think we understand we call laws. That's disingenuous. These are not laws, they're just models that mimic observations. So Coulomb's law is really Coulomb's model. So mathematical models only mimic nature. Nature is not obliged to follow them, so calling them laws is very disingenuous. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to repurpose the word law for ethereal mechanics. Uh, a law is a limitation that theories or models must obey. Like no paradoxes, no ano I mean, the pain, no paradoxes, anomalies, inconsistencies, or nonsense. Law of conservation of energy, law, because you can't really derive stuff from no anomalies. Okay, your just model has to be constrained by the fact there are no anomalies. Okay, so a law is not something you can derive something from, but it is a behavior that models must obey. So that's how we're going to use laws in the future in ethereal mechanics. We're going to pull anything that's really a model, we're not going to call it a law anymore. Although I may slip. All right, so let's talk about the new science paradigm. It's really simple. Rules of acquisition number 13. Okay, because of the rule of acquisition number one, there is no amount of experimentation that can ever prove a theory correct. So we're wasting effort with experiments designed to confirm theories. Rule of acquisition number two, since a single experiment can prove a theory wrong, then this is the most efficient path. So the new science model is to brainstorm all possible theory models and then run experiments to disprove as many as you can. Uh, this is how to short circuit the junk science curve, but we talked about that last time. Uh, the sole surviving model that may represent the best understanding until new theories are dreamed up or new observations are made. So let's do a little example here. Let's just say, let's go back before the day of Galileo, before we knew that the Earth was round, and let's say we made an observation that the, that, or about the time we knew the Earth was round, and say that we saw the sun moves across the sky. So what's our theory? We've got some multiple theories here. We've got the sun god, the heavenly objects orbit the Earth, that the Earth rotates, or we're just going to make an empirical model without trying to guess what the actual underlying theory is. Okay, and so what would the model look like? That's the theory of the model. The sun god would be a page from the sun god's day planner. We'd have a mathematical model here that um, shows the heavenly objects orbiting with maybe some theta or something like that. The earth rotates. We're going to show in the model that the stars are stationary, or the sun's stationary, and that the earth is the one that's rotating. And Stonehenge, we're just going to put stones up where the sun goes down, or goes up or down, wherever. And so when we make some more observations, we're going to see that all these can form. So they're all useful. All of them are useful. So let's say we learn more about the universe. We decide, oh, you know, let's try to add the stars to this model. Well, the problem is the sun god model is going to fall out because it's really, there's, there's no star gods, so that sun god fails. The empirical model, well, we derived it for the sun, so it, can, it really only works for the sun. Um, we can say that heavenly objects orbit the Earth, but then we run into this conundrum because that means that the farther the stars are from the Earth, the faster they're going to be going. Okay, for, based on the rotational velocity times the distance, you know, d theta, well, whatever. That means as far there's going to be a point far enough away where stars are going to be going faster and faster and faster and faster than the speed of light. Stars are going to be accelerating as you go farther and farther away. Gee, that sounds like Hubble's law, doesn't it? Okay, so that's looking like wildy coyote physics. Um, so and so we're going to throw that out because of wildy coyote physics, and we're going to say this is the better uh, conformity. This is more plausible. Okay. Oh, that was just what I was going to do on the paper here. The farther away you go, the stars are going to go faster and faster and faster. Okay, and because um, this is nonsense, this is, you know, because, oh, yeah, that was the argument I made. As they go faster and faster, that means there's more and more energy as you go farther away from the Earth, because mass times velocity squared is energy, that means stars are going to have infinite energy as you go farther. So that's like wild E. coyote, that's bordering on nonsense, that's why we're throwing that out. And even though this is the best model at this time, it doesn't mean that there's going to be more observations that might make that invalid and we have to come up with something else. Okay, so remember, models are just mimics, theories are just guesses, and observations can be misleading. Okay, so the way we have to do science, we have to turn basically everything around. So what's next? Video 9, we're going to demystify math. We're going to show math is nothing more than counting chickens, and nature is a complete subset. And then we're going to talk about the epochs of natural structure, which is a new way I have of looking at the universe and how things fit together. And then we're going to use that um, to look at Mother Nature in general. And we have a very interesting little epiphany that came out of that. And then we're going to recap the rules of acquisition. And then we're going to go on to our quest for the ether. So if you can donate, I'd really appreciate it. Thank you.